welcome to Green Heart Connects. I'm Marcel and I'll be your host. Thank you for joining us. Green Heart Connects is a monthly online series where we gather and exchange ideas for caring for the earth and for each other. Through facilitated discussions and curated presentations, people from around the world share inspiring stories, tips, suggestions, and resources to improve local communities and the world. Green Heart Connects is brought to you by Green Heart International, a not-for-profit organization facilitating global understanding through cultural exchange programs for Americans and young people around the world. Thank you for being here. Exchange has the power to broaden perspectives and to change lives. We think you'll be inspired by our guests. Green Heart Connects explores several themes throughout the year, environmentalism, volunteerism, fair trade, and personal growth. Today, we are talking with Megan Westervelt and Josue Arteaga. Megan is a conservation photojournalist and a former Fulbright scholar. She tells visual stories about indigenous communities and human impact on the environment. Josue is a wildlife and conservation biologist from Ecuador. He studies birds, raptors, and predator-prey interactions. His field research explores predator-prey interactions and the balance of conservation and societal conflict in wildlife management. They met in Ecuador, later married, and today they live in a geodesic dome home in Ohio. They are combining visual storytelling and research data to improve efforts to conserve and preserve fragile ecosystems on the fringes of human populations. And after the presentation, we will meet back here for a live Q&A with Megan and Josue. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, I'm Megan Westervelt, originally from Durango, Colorado. I'm a conservation photojournalist and a visual storytelling instructor. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. Hi, I'm Josue Arteaga. I'm originally from Quito, Ecuador, and I'm a wildlife and conservation biologist. Uh, my pronouns are he, his, him. We'd like to welcome you to our bubble. <laughs> we live in a geodesic dome home in the middle of rural Ohio. We would like to tell you a little bit about how we got here, and it all started with conservation. I became since I was little to be really interested in nature. I really wanted to study animals. I was fascinated of how animals, what they are thinking and what is happening in their minds. So when I was little, I will go to explore nature because I was fortunate enough that Quito in Ecuador, it's a big city, but it's very close to a lot of nature. Ecuador is a small country, but with a lot of diverse ecosystems. So we will be easily driving an hour and a half to go to the mountains and be in these amazing paramo ecosystems that are like kind of like a tundra in the mountains. But also we will be able to drive 45 minutes out in another direction and be in the middle of the cloudy forest or a dry forest in the mountains or even go down to the Amazon region or to the coast. So it will be a very fascinating and amazing place to be uh, especially as a person that loves nature. So I was very curious since I was little and that allowed me to kind of uh, start exploring different things that I would like to do in the future. And my parents were very supportive of this. So when I was 16, I had my first experience, close experience with wildlife. When I did a volunteer work with a rescue center of birds of prey, so falcons, hawks, eagles, owls, and I was uh, working with this center for like three months. And they basically do, they use falconry techniques, so hunting with birds of prey, so similar techniques that they get the bird on the hand and all of that, to rehab uh, birds that have been kind of like caught uh, through illegal trafficking or that they've been uh, uh, hurt through flying uh, to a building or things like that. And I was able to have this close contact with the birds of prey and I knew I wanted to study these guys. So I fell in love with them. I decided to keep that pad and keep doing 
more learning about animals and birds especially so i became a biologist so i was uh, exploring all different places and i, I had a mentor Chita de Vries, that is the expert of the galapagos hawk so as a biologist being able to do research in galapagos was amazing so after all of that experience i've seen more and more how data was important for doing conservation because going blindsided to work in conservation is not the best approach to do it because you might feel that you're doing a good job but data is showing you that actually you could put the same amount of efforts in something else and have a greater impact for example with sea turtles that you put all the efforts in uh, raising the babies but data have shown us that yes it's a good part but where you really can make a change is for example if fisheries put a uh, deterrence so they don't capture uh, turtles by bycatch and actually that has a bigger impact and that was thanks to all the data collected and different statistical models that they build so i saw how data is so important for this and through all my fieldwork uh, experience with research i wanted to explore more so i decided to go into a master's degree in ecology and ecology is basically the study of how living things interact with each other or with the environment and i wanted to study behavior in ecology and i did my master's in canada in edmonton in the university of alberta and that actually got me to a different perspective i was studying birds in uh, almost at the opposite ed end of the continent there's no like one country that owns the birds and there's big big institutions that work uh, tirelessly to kind of like help with birds that are migratory birds and for example the over a hundred years ago they came up with the bird treaty act that is a big uh, agreement law in north america to protect all migratory birds and that's an agreement between canada us and mexico but birds go farther down south and also in Ecuador, we receive birds that come from the south. So there's no real limitation for them. They just fly over the borders and borders have become kind of like a really center point of human perspective. And it's just like a limitation that we put ourselves to my point of view. And thanks to the information that we have learned for birds, we now know these kind of important matters that conservation in Costa Rica will be as important in conservation in Colombia and that will affect birds that are coming to the US. Like animals, they don't see these fake imaginary border that we have. And that gave me to the idea that actually conservation doesn't happen in one place. Conservation and efforts for conservation are not just working in one place. Like it is a whole connection network. So for example, with birds, you will have these uh, birds migrating all the way from North America to Central America. And they will be in these places in Central America that need, they need to live. Growing shade grow, uh, coffee. It is a very sustainable way of producing on the field and have a very good uh, source of money for people that are living in these communities and at the same time preserving the forest and that allows these birds, even though they are protected in other areas, in these areas, they might be affected. By doing this, you can help them to have a better chance to preserve the environment in which they live. And that really makes a huge difference. And so I start seeing how it matters and it's an interdisciplinary thinking that we need to have in order to help conservation. And that's something I really like about what Megan works in because she works with the indigenous communities in the places that nature is living actively with them. So. I was born a story collector, much like you were a biologist. Maybe they didn't know those terms, but that's what we love to do. Um, I would sit by the hour and listen to my dad tell stories. Uh, I got my first camera when I was pretty young and started documenting my world. And then I think around the time that you started volunteering, 16, around that age. Mm -hmm. um, I also, around that age, went to Southern Africa uh, with my parents. We spent about two months in Namibia. Namibia was so magical for me at that, you know, very pivotal time in my life as a teenager to figure out, you know, who I was and what I wanted to do. 
and we'd recently invested in a new digital camera. I was in charge of it. And I fell so hard and madly in love with visual storytelling. Uh, mostly began with the wildlife, um, but then we visited some indigenous communities as well, um, of Himba especially, and I fell in love. I fell in love with their way of living, uh, with their dress, with everything. Um, you know, it was, it was very unique to me, something I'd never experienced. And so it, yeah, it was magical. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. And, and I, I wanted to dedicate my life from then on to the natural world, to conserving what we had. But I realized soon thereafter that just creating beautiful images of nature is often not enough to move people to preserve it. Um, especially in areas of the world where there are a lot of natural resources that we're dependent upon now uh, for extraction and use in our economy. So I realized I needed to start working with people as well. So after uh, I realized what I wanted to do with my life, um, I, did, I did go to college for journalism and international studies because I did not understand that photojournalism could be its own career. Yeah. Some of us take longer. So uh, I then went to grad school at Ohio University for photography, photojournalism. Um, and upon graduating, received a Fulbright grant that took me down to this research station where I met Josue in the middle of the Amazon. Um, in the heart of Amazonian Ecuador, there's a national park called Yasuni National Park. And that is where we met at the research station there. Yes, I was working as a teacher assistant for my supervisor, Chita de Bris. He was teaching the field course, uh, like field, uh, field work te techniques. And we will spend 10 days in the field in the research station in the middle of the Amazon. And it just as it turns out, you were there working with indigenous communities. We connected so much from the very beginning because our hearts were both very much there and invested in conservation. I wanted to work with indigenous communities to understand the impact of a recently failed initiative uh, the country had proposed called the Yasuni ITT initiative that would have kept the oil in the ground under this national park in exchange for uh, basically half the amount of the value of that oil coming from other you know predominantly first world countries countries that were using the oil products um, the Ecuadorian government had asked to receive those funds and they would leave the land alone from extraction. Well, that pretty quickly failed. Um, I don't know if it was a wholehearted initiative attempt, but, um, nevertheless, I was interested in now, you know, what these communities were wanting to do to conserve their culture and their environment in light of that recent failure. So that's why I was down there. Um, I was documenting their culture. I'm learning so much every day, uh, talking to scientists at the research station, trying to really grasp the importance of the biodiversity in this area. Um, and I quickly realized at the time that visual storytelling was the way to go for me, but not from my perspective, <laughs> that I was doing a grave injustice to the people and communities there, um, and even um, the forest resources, uh, as well as wildlife and the entire ecosystem, by trying to cover everything from with my camera from my perspective, right? So I quickly realized it would be much more effective if I placed the camera uh, in the hands of the community members. So that's what I did. Um, which turned out to be very successful. I thought we had a big exhibition involving over 50 photographers from different communities. And then I realized though that, you know, the, the true power of conservation was gonna be interdisciplinary. I couldn't just work with people um, because it was hard to explain to them the importance of conserving species and not overhunting and um, you know, not logging. And so I needed the data oftentimes to back that up uh, and to help better explain what was going on sort of on a global level. And so we've come to really collaborate a lot in our lives um, and, and realize that, you know, in a way I was 
sort of collecting this qualitative data that was aiding to cultural and environmental conservation both mm -hmm. because they are intrinsically linked, which you've found as well, you've noted. Yes, and, and the thing is that I, as a biologist, I was never really looking into communities. I was just working with the wildlife. And then I love the work Megan does because preserving cultural heritage is so meaningful because it is a way that we were connected more with nature back in our past. And we kind of lost a little bit that. So the work that she does is truly helping conserve a culture, but rea in reality, she's conserving nature by conserving culture. So it is a way that connects like the idea of like, you need to preserve and there's a little bit of fight about like you just need to preserve and don't touch but we are part of nature like humans are part of nature we're living creatures so thinking that we need to be outside of the natural world it is something that we we misunderstood like we are part of the natural world and when you are in the amazon region you see it and it feels endless it really feels like an endless place but then when you see the data and you see how it changed over the years, like you really see what is the effect of what things we're doing. And, and it's kind of like anecdotal, I, 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 like mm -hmm. just from the perspective of the cultures, they will, they themselves will say, oh, there used to be more animals in this area. We will see more animals around here, but they don't see it as a big change. They see it like a small change. And that's because they don't have the broader perspective. So I feel like that kind of like links back to the idea of like conservation needs to be more global because in the long term, in the big scale, we can see the changes, but we need to think globally at the same time that we act locally. That small uh, effort that you can put in conservation through changing your habits of what you eat, where you go to, what kind of things you use, it can make a big difference. Like the shade grown coffee, that is just getting a coffee cup in your coffee store in nearby, but knowing where that coffee is coming from can make a big difference. And that is just thinking locally, uh, thinking globally, but acting locally in my local coffee store. Oh, do you know that you can get some shade grown coffee and it's actually very sustainable. Mm -hmm. And those little impacts even though it seems like just like a cup of coffee can make a big difference. And that's the same with photography, right? One image can change and mm -hmm. has the course of history. So one small act can make a huge difference for conservation. Um, so when I'm working with communities in visual storytelling, I, I try to share some of those images. Some of the first images that I, I usually share with them are those um, that led to the national park system. The work that we do, both as a storyteller and as a wildlife biologist, they are really interconnected, even if they don't seem like it, because you cannot do conservation for wildlife without sharing and truly telling the story of what's happening. But Megan wouldn't be able to say, to tell the story if she doesn't have the data to back up what she's trying to help with. So it's kind of like an interconnection between the two worlds that really have got us to thinking more and more how we can collaborate with each other. Uh, besides just being a happily married couple, how we can with our work help each other to promote better conservation and help with conservation. Because conservation is not just one perspective, it's not just one place, it's not just one country, it's everything. It's one world. Like we are human citizens of the world. One thing uh, that I'm looking forward is to trying to use new tools that allow us to monitor the wildlife without getting in, in conflict or interact with the animals itself, like camera traps and things like that. What we call passive monitoring. So putting devices out using the technologies that we have at, uh, these days to really understand what's happening with the world close to human beings and how we can change our behavior to be a better neighbor with nature because there's a lot of like light pollution and sound pollution from humans from even good efforts with ecotourism 
but how can we be better neighbors when we are doing this? And how can we really do a meaningful conservation? My next step will be uh, to launch a nonprofit organization um, called Initialize that will work to empower indigenous communities like those in Amazonian Ecuador um, around the world, especially those located in areas where um, the environment's undergoing a lot of degradation for one reason or another, um, and also where their indigenous cultural traditions are disappearing, perhaps their language is, is eroding. Um, so to try to preserve some of that uh, in areas that, that the communities have interest in doing so um, and bringing that to global to a global audience um, to do something about it, right? To, to bring change where change is needed. Yeah, well, it is very, very cool the steps we're going into uh, because I feel we will get more and more to work together in different projects. And I love the idea of like working with indigenous communities that I've never did before as a biologist until I start being with Megan. Well, and I never got to work with scientists, so. This or is, wildlife. Or wildlife. <laughs> Science should be just a way to kind of like imagine what we can do as humans. Science can be really powerful by itself, but without communication, it just gets lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, staying knowledgeable about what's happening around the globe, um, but acting locally, I think is kind of the, that key sweet spot. Um, and we, you know, we've chosen a life of daily cultural exchange here in the house, <laughs> personally and professionally. Um, and that's because, and we've chosen that intentionally because we've seen it break down barriers and uh, open, you know, uh, our minds and work to new perspectives uh, and collaborators. And, and we found that that really gives strength and resilience to our conservation goals. So if you have interest um, in, in cultural exchange, in, you know, um, scientific Wild. work, mm -hmm. wildlife, wildlife. Uh, and working with indigenous communities or storytelling or photography, please don't hesitate to reach out, email us, look us up on, on social media. Um, yeah, we look so forward to sharing conversations and bringing more people on board. Thank you so much for inviting us. We are happy to share our world with you guys. And remember that everybody is a new world, so just open your mind to be breaking those barriers of your mind and be open to learn about new worlds and enjoy the adventure. <laughs>
Hi, everyone, and we are live today with Megan and Josue. Hi, guys. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hello. We're so happy that you can join us today. Tell us where you're joining us from. Well, thank you for having us. So we are currently in Athens, Ohio, in the southeast corner of Ohio. It is a university town where Ohio University is located, where Megan is currently studying. My MFA program is located here. That's wonderful. Well, we're so excited to talk to you and there's lots of questions that we want to ask you based on the video presentation that we just saw. But before we do that, I'd like to welcome everyone who are joining us today from wherever parts of the world that you are from. I think I saw um, someone from Madrid, from Spain, um, from the Philippines, um, somewhere from different parts of the U.S. So welcome. We're so glad that you are here with us today. And if you have not done so already, please be sure to say hi uh, so we know who you are and where you're, um, where, who you are, where you're joining us from or where you're from. And then if you have a question um, for Megan and Josue or if you have any comments or feedback that you'd like to share, definitely put it down in the comment section below um, and then I will read through them throughout the uh, live Q&A today. Before we get started, I do want to give a shout out um, because Green Heart uh, Connects has been around for one year now, and it has been a journey. We would like to thank all of our viewers and all of our speakers who have inspired us every month that we do these programs. Um, there's tons of stories uh, covering so many different topics, and we hope that this has been a, um, an inspiring, part of your life, whether you have watched one episode or you have watched all of the episodes, we thank you for being here with us and uh, for continuing to um, watching us and supporting us. So thank you. All right. So I would love to start us off with your wonderful, wonderful geodesic dome home. Uh, we saw a little bit of it earlier in the video, but can you please describe it for those of us who have not seen one live? Um, or know what is it? It's unique looking, but what is it? Well, it's our little little bubble of heaven. Um, do you want to tell them about how small it is? Yeah, so uh, two, and, two and a half years ago, more or less, Megan uh, moved here uh, to Ohio, and we were looking for a place to stay. So we were looking in the area, and we had an event to welcome the new students on her program. And we, were to, we went to a social event that was located next door to our current house, the geodesic dome. So we just passed by and we saw it and it was super interesting. Like you will never think of a house in that shape because it's like a soccer ball. So it is just a little ball in the middle of nowhere because it, this is rural Ohio. So there will be big areas of forest between houses. So we were very intrigued and uh, the neighbor that was the director of the program, uh, he told us that they were selling the house over a year ago. So we decided to give it a look and Megan visited and it really aligns with our sustainability goals. It's very eco-friendly. Um, we have a beautiful pollinator friendly prairie right in front that the previous owners planted and, and we just sometimes never want to leave, but obviously our work's very internationally oriented. So <laughs> we, we come back to our yeah, we, we go back and forth. We have many homes. Um, so that's just, yeah, our current living space. But um, it, it's pretty inspiring to live in there. Well, it's definitely unique and wonderful. And I know that you guys have made it very homey. We do have someone um, joining us today, um, Jason from, from St. Louis. Um, he said that he loves your house or your home. And he said, it makes me think of Buckminster Fuller. Has his work had any influence on you? Oh my goodness, I, I have to admit my ignorance here because I'm not sure who that is, I'm so sorry, but the previous owners actually ordered the home as a kit and built it themselves back, um, I think about 13 or 14 years ago. So potentially there was some, some influence there. I, I would love to learn more about that individual. Well, let's, uh, let's talk more about your expertise, photojournalist, uh, Megan. I think you mentioned during the segment, one photo can contribute or make a lot of change, which is very, very true. What kinds of projects are on your list? Um, 
And also, what what do you do to prepare for a for an environmental conservation photo project? Oh, such good questions. All right, so um, I'll start with the former. I um, I of course have an ongoing list of ideas that in this one lifetime, I probably won't finish. Maybe if I'm if I'm given another chance or two. Um, but I I tend to now focus my energy uh, towards really empowering other storytellers um, rather than just producing my own work um, and in taking part in collaborative efforts. Uh, so that's been my focus recently. Um, I'm I'm looking to work in a lot more uh, fragile environments um, that right are on right there on the human wildlife uh, interface, um, you know, which is all anywhere basically in the world. But um, and and maybe in collaboration with some of the work that Josue is going to be doing potentially for his PhD. Um, so yeah, I, I think project and storytelling management is sort of almost in a direction where I'm headed as a photojournalist, just because I see the power. Um, of empowering other storytellers more so than just the work I can produce alone. Um, in terms of preparing, I do quite a bit of research beforehand. For example, when I was working down with um, the Warani communities in Yasuni, um, I did quite a bit of, of reading up beforehand on um, both sort of the as far back as I could, their, their history um, with, you know, first contact in terms of missionaries and oil companies and how those dynamics played out all the way to present day what's happening now. Um, talking with people who've been working there, uh, potentially collaborating with organizations in the areas where I'm now headed, how I would like to continue preparing for projects is, is much more collaborative. Um, and, and I think that, you know, checking what's happening in current news and uh, and on social media to a degree as well trying to stay um up to date so that my work's relevant um and and actually contributing to the global conversation ongoing it is so so important i agree with you and and one thing uh what, what you were saying just now really caught my attention because you said um just now and also in the video presentation about putting the camera in the hands of the community um, can you compare what differences that you see in what or how things are photographed? What do you see that's different? Oh, I so wish that I could have them here to speak. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're much more articulate in, in describing how um, their experiences have been. But from what they've shared with me, um, you know, I, I think that they start to value their traditions and um, some of their daily life customs a lot more and a lot differently when they're photographing them themselves. Like, a, you know, obviously if I go to photograph my day, I'm not going to see a lot very special about it, um, which is how they felt until we started talking about it. And then they could kind of sit back and observe from more an objective point of view, even though their work was very personal and very subjective at the time of making it. So um, their creative process is beautiful. And, you know, watching people who've become accustomed to tourists coming in with these big cameras, and then just being, you know, on the receiving end of everything, now being able to be like, okay, what do I want to shoot? What do I want to tell? Um, it, I think it has been very empowering uh, overall. I, I um, yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done in terms of um, what they want to do with that power, right? But, but we're getting there step by step. Well, my next question was, how do you think that that action or that empowerment is helping to conserve or preserve the environment? Um, are they talking about it? Are they seeing it? Are you giving them specific pointers or helping them see it from that lens, pun intended? <laughs> Um, fantastic question. That's actually the base question for my current MFA thesis field work. So <laughs> we are investigating just that because, of course, there's many observations and assumptions I can make from the previous work I've done. Um, but because I was not able to continue sort of monitoring um, the long term impact of the projects we did, I, I don't actually have, I can't give you evidence or a 
um, you know, a very firm answer on that one yet. I think it's very much evolving and I look forward to discovering that and how, you know, they, they love to share their images of what they're doing and, and um, try to connect to people around the world. Uh, they really enjoy inviting people to their community. So I think it'll play a big part in ecotourism. That's what they've expressed interest in as a next step. Um, there's not a lot of other uh, revenue um, possibilities uh, right now for them. So I think that that will be kind of where we're headed potentially. And that's what we're hoping to see. So thank you for continuing to work on it. And I know that that's also the focus of um, your graduate work. So we're looking forward to hearing more about it as time progresses. Um, let's jump over to Josue and talk about birds. Um, <laughs> Obviously, you're the expert, but you mentioned about the simple yet powerful decision to choose shade-grown coffee as a way to help save the land for migratory birds. Can you share with us if you have suggestions for small or even larger changes that we can do to help birds thrive? That's actually a super beautiful question. I always love it. I don't feel, first of all, considered an expert on birds. I'm still learning a lot. I do have a lot of passion for them eh, and I'm always happy to share it. Eh, so there's, there was in 2018, a big celebration for the 100 year eh, event of, eh, celebration of the 100 year foundation of the Bird Treaty Act. This bird, big eh, treaty to protect all migratory birds. And within this, big organizations, uh, the most important ones working on bird conservation, Audubon Society, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, National Geographic, BirdLife International, all of them, all those four major conservation institutions got together and they started develop this, how we can help, how we can do, like every individual have a small actions that can help. And they came up with this kind of like a, uh, advice of how to support birds in seven simple steps. And that was a uh, planting native, uh, using native plants in your gardens. Because when you do that, you help uh, insects that are native in the area to survive. Insects is our ma a main, main, main source of food for a lot of birds. So just by doing that, you are already helping. Instead of planting a uh, grass, you can do your garden, your lawn and in, in the front, be more inclusive for native wildlife. Uh, then the other one was like the shade grown coffee. So what happens is that uh, these places that uh, uh, start uh, growing shade grown coffee, they need the shade so they preserve the forest so there's less uh, destruction of the environment where the, these birds go to survive uh, during the summer where they are their summer grounds. So they also don't do use pesticides that helps with the coffee but also helps that the insects don't die so the birds can survive and they have food. And that was the third advice from the, these big organizations. Don't try to avoid pesticides as much as possible uh, because uh, maybe it doesn't seem like a big effect, but that insect that is disappearing is food for the chicks of the birds. And that kind of grows over the food chain uh, and it can become something important later on. And the other one is uh, try to avoid using lights overnight when it's migration times because birds get confused with the lights and they can crash into buildings. And following that is the idea that sometimes windows can be a very, very problematic thing uh, for birds. They have a lot of collisions with windows. And there's simple things like putting a small dots on the window or putting stickers on the windows that can help the birds to see the window because they don't see this barrier. So they just go thinking that there's other place where they can stand at the other side, but they don't see the glass. So that can help as well. And then the other one, one is escaping my mind, but the, the other one that I remember is keep your cats indoor. So cats are a big problem. And actually there's a big debate about that because there's a lot of, uh, uh, pet societies that are not super happy with the idea of keeping cats indoors, but actually the data shows that cats can survive longer. They have a bigger lifespan in the, if they are kept indoor because they don't run into cars, they are not uh, fighting against other dogs or other cats or wildlife outside, but also for the bird biologist perspective, 
they are a major predator. I love predators and they are the best predators that exist in the world. They have a huge variety of preys they can get into. So they are actually very resourceful and they can hunt different birds. So that's a problem because when you consider how many cats are kept outdoors, that becomes a problem because they already have food at home. So those are kind of like simple things that the societies have suggested. And yeah, there's a lot of resources online of how you can help birds, but those are kind of like simple things that you can do at home. Well, fascinating. And thank you for sharing. I mean, who knew a couple of things, cats <laughs> are predators, different kinds of cats, predators of different kinds of birds. And then also um, your own garden, you don't have to go far. That's something that you can do, each of us can do to make a difference. And then also the lights out. I mean, birds crashing into windows are awful. And so that's, those are simple things that we can do to make a difference. So thank you for sharing those very um, helpful tips um, for all of us who may not know or think about this on a daily basis. So definitely appreciate it. Um, so we, I have a, a question here from one of our audience. Um, Laura from Spain um, is saying that the blending of your work is inspiring and reminds us that each of us can have a positive impact um, on our environment, just as we were just talking about. So thank you for your informative, um, informative presentation. Over the years, Greenheart has partnered closely with Pachamama Alliance based in the Ecuadorian Amazon and the indigenous communities like the Ashwar. Are you familiar with Pachamama? I'm guessing you are because you were nodding. Um, are you familiar with their work and have you collaborated with them or perhaps with other organizations with common goals? Oh my God, uh, that was Laura, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic question, Laura. I am looking so forward to the possibility of working with Pachamama. I've I've researched a lot about them, read a lot about their work. Um, I've not had a chance to reach out and collaborate. I hope they'd be open to it. Um, I do hope to also collaborate maybe with Hoko Toko, which is um, a leading bird focused organization in Ecuador as well. Yeah. Um, so so far, I've just worked with a lot of academic. Um, departments at the uh, Catholic University of Ecuador in Quito um, and, you know, some other um, youth empowerment based nonprofits, but I look very forward to collaborating more because that is what I'm about and it's just a matter of sitting down and communicating with people and finding time and making time. So thank you for reminding me of, of Pachamama. Wonderful. Well, we can probably help with um, providing the connection or making the connection as well. Um, we do have someone here joining us from Ecuador. Her name is Andrea or Andrea. Um, she would love to know if Megan and Josue are planning on socializing their efforts to preserve these fragile ecosystems so that more young people in Ecuador can get involved with these projects and help in some way. Yeah, so uh, our work is a start, it's a starting at this moment. So we, uh, the main objective that at least I have and Megan I know shares with me quite a bit is try to empower people in the area, not just bringing people from outside helping, but try to get the help from the country itself. So we are still developing the ideas of how we can do that. Uh, there's a lot of different complexities on that because we need to be able to allow a uh, access to that opportunities to different people in, in Ecuador, but we don't want to take away that opportunity from the people in the community itself. So there's a lot of uh, caveats on it, but we are working on it. Like we are really looking forward to do a lot of more work with uh, Ecuadorian uh, organizations as well as uh, individuals, civilians. Uh, but yeah, it's an uh, ongoing process at the moment. So there's is still a lot to develop. Yeah, and I'd say we're trying to find that balance between um, really focusing on what the community's asking for, right? What what help they need and based on their strengths, right? Working from a strengths-based um, approach. And um, so 
yeah, well, we, we definitely want to involve everybody we can. Uh, for now, if you're interested, Andrea, there is a volunteer program to work in the communities or where I've been working through um, the Catholic University. You don't have to be a student there. You can volunteer and work. Um, they're always needing some support in the schools there with the kids. Uh, and I think, you know, they can work with your expertise and kind of build a workshop around that. Or you could work with their already existing academic schedule and help to uh, kind of fill in when they're maybe missing some resources. So, um, so yeah, please reach out to us on social if you're interested in, in that opportunity. Excellent, thank you so much. And yes, part of the Green Heart Connects mission is all about making connections and connecting people um, from all over the world and all across the US um, who are interested in making a difference and focusing on different topics. So obviously this, this month is environmentalism and hopefully um, Andrea and whoever else who are joining us can get inspired and realize that it's not hard to, to do something. Um, every little bit helps, definitely. But talking about all of these communities, you know, especially you talk about involving indigenous people on the edges of this delicate or endangered ecosystems to help conserve or preserve the land. So tell us more about that. What leverage do they have? What have you seen to be successful in guiding them towards that preservation and or prosperity? Sure. So um, it's a, they're in a, I, I would say first and foremost, um, trying to understand the position that community members are in right now um, is absolutely fundamental uh, as we work forward, move forward with our work. Um, so what's happened is that uh, a lot of the oil companies um, offered more work, you know, in previous years, and uh, especially with the pandemic, um, that work has not all but it's not disappeared, but it's, it's uh, definitely decreased. And so there's not, you know, a lot of, um, like I said before, revenue uh, possibility income flow into the community. Um, and so they're, they're really struggling with trying to balance, you know, how do we keep sustainable because we want, you know, we, they thrive in the forest. We, they want to preserve, um, uh, from my understanding, their communities and have be able to live there and have their children prosper and live there as well. Um, but you know, they're they're reliant upon the resources available to them, which which are the natural resources around them more um, than the economic resources right now. And so um, it's it's a definite def delicate balance um, in in terms of of helping to realize their vision while also meeting basic needs, um, which is of course the conversation we we uh, see globally almost everywhere um and so I think moving forward it will be really exciting um to turn sort of this this data vision with the storytelling into something that works for the community's vision of what they want and what they need both um and then empower them so they have you know they had for a long time um small ponds behind the certain portion of the community where they would raise fish and then be able to sell them. Um, they were doing a, a school community garden, school and community garden, um, with some produce coming from there. They definitely have started building a bit of the infrastructure for ecotourism, um, but without, um, we'll say, any real support coming from, you know, the government or too many nonprofits uh, that I know of working in the area yet. Um, it's been really a struggle for them. I've, I've, at least from my perspective, witnessed that. So I look forward to, um, you know, helping them talk about the challenges and, and see what connections, as you were just saying, we can make um, so that their desire to keep thriving in that geographic space, right, can live and coexist with the, what the natural environment around them requires. Absolutely. And it's a work in progress. And sometimes it can be slow, but as long as we keep on working towards it, I think we'll get there. Um, we have one last question, and this is probably, we can make it as simple as possible. We have Megan joining us from Denver. She's asking, and I think this is what a lot of people are also thinking about, what support could people around the globe uh, provide who may not be able to help in the communities, the specific communities that you're working with? 
That is a great question. Do you want to start? Mm, you start. Well, it's your, your, I mean. So the thing is like, as I was saying in the video. Yeah. Small actions in your area don't seem like a big help, but in the long end, it could help everybody. So for example, when you're talking about, when I'm talking about locally, not necessarily locally in your neighborhood, it could be locally in your city, it could be locally in your state, but your help in that area, it's a help to the whole world because in one way or another, everything is connected. So just being more aware of every single thing we do has an impact on the world can make a big difference. So it seems silly to, okay, I'm trying to reduce my consumption of plastic. What product in the store between these two has less plastic or which one I can have a better impact in the world if I choose this over this. And I consider also that there will be people struggling with budget, but that little difference, it doesn't seem, is not as little as it seems. Mm -hmm. That is the main thing that I will say, like, don't feel like you are out isolated from the world. You are part of the world. So every single thing you do can help in the long end. And I think if you're someone who's like not able to travel, maybe you're just doing a rock star job of being the greatest parent in the world, which is the hardest job in the world. Um, you know, it's all about educating too. So raising a child who's very aware of um, what's happening in the world and their role in that, I think can be some of the, can have some of the greatest long-term um, impact and, and make the biggest difference. Yeah, I feel like positive energy and like helping one each other in this world can have a big effect. In the and future. working from a place of compassion, right, rather than any, you know, judgment. Wait, yeah, <laughs> I just don't understand judgment because how can you understand what anyone else is really going through? So working from a place of compassion, I would say too. Absolutely, keeping an open mind and always working towards something. And this, I wrote this down as I was watching the presentation earlier. Um, I think it was Jose who mentioned conservation is not just one country, it's all of us. And that is so true. Every one of us can, can make a difference. And because of that, it's even, your work is even more important. The work that you do together, the photos combined with the data behind it, that's excellent. And we thank you so much for joining us today and for allowing us to learn more about conservation and everything that we can do in our own backyard um, to make a difference and knowing that every little bit helps. So um, we wish you all the best in everything that you're doing and everything that's going on in your lives and also for your next project, especially your upcoming nonprofit, Initial Eyes. Thank you so, so much, Marcel. We've had an absolute blast working with Greenheart. We look forward to continued collaboration. And yeah, and thank you so much to everybody watching. I know uh, depending on where you are, you're having lunch or it's an early morning or late at night. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us and you being here is already supporting us. So thank you for that. Excellent. And I saw one last comment here from Daniel Arteaga saying, hi, dear son. So <laughs> I'm assuming yes. you know who yes. that is. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Well, for everyone else, stay tuned for more information and wonderful presentation from our global community. We have thousands of Greenheart friends and partners from around the world who share our commitment to connecting people and planet. And today, we are sharing the story of Timotina Boake, a Greenheart alumna. Her project involved creating an environmentally sustainable cleanup in a village in Ghana, and from that, creating a second source of income for the women and youth there. So please watch. Hi, my name is Timotina Boache and I live in Accra, Ghana. The title of my purpose project is Transforming the Environment, Transforming Lives. I adopted Isikabiu, a community in the eastern region of Ghana, for this purpose project. When you walk into the community of Isikabiu, it's a very youthful population, quite a peasant community where the men and women and youth 
mainly engage in farming activities. When I entered the community, I realized that they had a serious sanitation problem. There was litter all over the place and the people of the community didn't have a great waste management system. And that is where I got the idea that instead of littering and leaving all the waste they created on the floor or in places that deface their community, how about we, en we engage them in an upcycling project where they can turn the waste they create into, in the environment into reusable eco-friendly products for sale. By so doing, we're able to kill two birds with a stone by one, helping the, the environment and the community become more environmental, environmentally sustainable. And secondly, to create a second stream of income for the youth and the women in the community. I was fortunate to have been awarded a grant from Purpose Earth, and this grant came a long way to support the project and the dream I had. With the grant, I was able to provide the community with recycling bins where they could sort out the waste in the community, plastic waste, metal waste, and then um, paper waste. And with the, with the grants received, I also bought some stationery and materials we could use to upcycle the waste they produced. I'm very proud to say that by the end of the project, I was able to train and teach 25 women and youth in the community, and we turned the waste they create in the environment into jewelry, laptop bags, pencil cases, flower vases for sale. The second phase of the project is to find people who would like to buy these items and then sell these um, reusable, eco-friendly products and generate some income for the community so they can keep up this good work. Thank you so much, Purpose Earth, for helping me bring my dream into a reality. Thank you. That was truly inspirational. Do you have an idea to share with us about personal development or taking care of the environment or of each other? If you do, please email us your idea at connects at greenheart.org. We would love to hear from you and potentially feature you on an upcoming Greenheart Connects episode or highlight you on our social media channels. There's so much that I've learned today and many, many thanks to Megan and Yosue for joining us as well as to Timotina for sharing your story today. And many thanks to all of you for being here and participated by asking questions today. Join us on October 21st at 11 a.m. Central Time when we talk with the Yellow Tulip Project. The Yellow Tulip Project creates a space for youth to talk about mental health and to smash the stigma. In schools and neighborhoods around the country, the Yellow Tulip Project team of ambassadors plant hope gardens of, you guessed it, yellow tulips. This builds hope and community, and it inspires productive conversations on how to combat the rising rates of suicide. The Yellow Tulip Project was born after the suicide of two of Julia Hansen's young friends and the head-on need to address depression with her family. So on October 21st, we will talk with this team about the work that they do in schools and in gardens around the country. I think you'll be inspired. Do you want to learn about ways to care for our planet and for each other? Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We hope that you will share greenheartconnects.org with your friends and families and colleagues all over the world. And later today, this full episode will be available online. You could also check out all past episodes that are available to view on greenheartconnects.org. There are so many great speakers and engaging topics that you can choose from. Be sure to also check out the resources page for more information that has been shared by our speakers. And finally, please join us on our social media channel so that we can continue the conversation and support one another. We want to hear what you are doing to make the world a better place. Until then, we hope to see you here again on October 21st, 2021 for the next Green Heart Connects. Thank you.